You're going to have 90 seconds each table. You're going to do a version of pointless. You know the TV program? Right? We've come up with the least obvious answer to the question. The question is each table is going to work on the same question, which is going to be great in the data. So I want each table to put their heads together, you'll have 90 seconds to come up with some examples of innovators. Let's, let's, let's not go great, let's just go innovators. And of course the aim is to come up with a name that the other tables will come up with. I don't know your space, so you can give me any name, and I will just go like that, I'll accept it. But you have a peer group here. So if you're choosing people who are innovating in your space, you need to think about will the other people around the table, around the room, know that they are. But you could go for Elon Musk, then everyone's going to go for Elon Musk. Would you go for Nikolai Tesla? Possibly, but if you did mouse on the table, another table, we wouldn't get pointless. So that's the aim. 90 seconds. I'm going to time you. Put your heads together, get your head together, that's all. Innovators. You ready? No. 90 seconds, you know what I mean? So, what is that thing we need to do? Do you want to try and cut all the net? John Harris. John Harris. John Anybody else? No. 
University of Derbyshire. Do you recognize the name? Some of you do. Have you ever listened to Doctor Who? If so, the University of Derbyshire. This table. Inventor of Max, fantastic. And this table? Uh, we have John Harrison. John Harrison. If I read the correct commentary, it's on the long video problem. Good book, I'm sure. Yeah, it's a good book. And. Andrew Schlecker. Uh, probably that will to improve education around the world and then the other person. Innovator in education. Do other people know? Andrew Schlecker. Schlecker. And finally? We got more David Bowie. David Bowie. <laughs> Fantastic. So we have three musicians, I think. One film star, but Henry the Marvel's much more than that. Um, what do you notice about that list of names? The most men. Thank you. The most men. I think there's one. If you look at the Forbes list of um, current great business innovators, how many, how many women feature in the top 100? Five. One. Mind you, I think the methodology is not very good uh, because they went for chief execs of large tech businesses predominantly. How many female heads and large technicians? Um, so we're going to talk about the hero innovator. And uh, is it a myth? Is it a reality? I know this conference is about um, innovation. Um, I don't know much about it because I'm a late substitute. You should really have Arabella Ellis standing here. And honestly, I would pay for Arabella if I'm not sure I'd pay for me here. So I'm a late substitute because COVID still exists. And uh, it's COVID. And uh, she's not able to be with us, uh, with you today. So um, my fascination is with innovation, as probably um, you might guess. Um, given I started my career as a clinical psychologist, um, and I've ended up as a founder and CEO of a, a tech startup. Gyre. And Gyre is a kind of coming together of what's now 35 years of curiosity about how do, how can we make development available in a much more scalable way. So my career started from a world of clinical psychology and actually working in child and family services. Uh, I have a fascination with systems, and that's one of the themes for today. Because when you work with a family, you'll find that there's a child identified as symptomatic. And, of course, you get curious as to how that's happened within the school, within the systems around the child. I moved into business consulting, people consulting, uh, in the early 90s, and worked with many senior teams. I also ran the assessment practice for the thinking partnership. And what we have in Jaya is a combination of that world of assessment and development coming together in a digital platform. Focused on this aspiration, the world would be a better place if everyone had access to high quality, psychologically informed development. The reason I put this up is at Jaya.io, we've recently published a white paper, a white paper which is a pulling together of 30 years of research on the evidence for team effectiveness. So my original training was in clinical psychology, trained at the Institute of Psychiatry. It was drummed into me, the importance of rigor, research, data. Um, Interestingly, H.J. Isaac was the prophet in those days, and anyone who knows about Isaac might raise an eyebrow at the thought of rigor, but that's another story. We've looked at 30 years of research, 
through publications and imprints that I'm sure you're very familiar with, um, because it's a very large and very diverse literature. And we pull that together in this white paper. It's available. We don't ask anything of you. Simply go to Jaya.io. It's on the home page. Download it. You don't need to, to exchange email addresses. We're not going to bug you. It's part of our mission to disseminate evidence-based development uh, to the world. Um, Jaya's been going for three or four years. We rebranded as Jaya a year ago. And as I say, I'm both probably the lead innovator in Jaya and somebody who's deeply fascinated by it. what is innovation and why doesn't it happen? Because my argument's going to be that human beings almost can't stop themselves innovating. There's one way you can stop human beings innovating, and that's to put them in a large organization, it seems to me. <laughs> and we need to explore what's going on there, right? And I want to close out and giving you some tips for practice, which are a combination of things that are coming from our own research, but also from the white paper research we've been doing. Uh, and you, you'll download the white paper, and you'll see lots more tips, uh, 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 ideas for practice. So now I need to give you a little, just bear with me for a moment, just to give you a little bit of the, the, um, the framework that sits underneath Jaya. Um, you'll see why in a moment. So I said that I ran the assessment practice in the thinking partnership. It was a time of competencies, right? And I wasn't interested in assessing whether people could do something, but rather assessing who they were. So we developed a framework, which is actually a set of strengths of character and intelligences, multiple intelligences. And quite simply, within Jaya, one of the things people can do is to rate themselves, assess themselves on this framework. And as they do that, 34 is far too many to hold in mind. We thought it'd be helpful to see how they cluster. And we discovered when we looked at our data analytics, these clustering around what we've called leader types, or you could think of them as character types. If we had more time, I'd tell you more about these nine. I'd get you to think about which of these leader types are best fit for you personally. Yeah? Obviously, we're going to talk about the innovator. Um, but, you know, we could also spend time talking about the strategies. This conference is about innovation, but it's also about strategic clarity, thinking long term about the way in which the world is changing and how you need to respond to it. But it's also practical. You need practical leaders who can take it and turn it into reality, etc. We could work around this framework. We just don't have time to today. Um, Hold that in mind, that framework. Strengths mapping into leader types. We also, within the Jaya platform, give people, obviously, the opportunity to rate themselves, but also get feedback from colleagues and family and friends. So we have solo, what we call solo, which is a self-review. And we have viewpoints, people's views and perspectives on the individual. Now, sometimes they align, sometimes they don't. Here's an example. Actually, some of your profiles in terms of their self-view as an innovator, but in terms of viewpoints feedback, you can see the innovator score is much lower. I mean, you probably can't because you don't know the language yet, but here we have the innovator is the circle at the top of this head, and the viewpoints feedback much lower. Now, um, this is a really interesting story, which I'm going to develop in a moment. Stay with me, please. Because um, let's go to the character, the spirit of the innovator. There's often organizations who are looking for innovation locate innovation in the individual. It's what we do as a society. We locate things in the individual. We re locate resilience within an individual. We say, oh, they're a resilient person, or they're not. Whereas the psychological evidence is resilience res resides in the system around them. The more connected people are to family and friends and supportive work colleagues, the more resilient they are. 
So, so there's, there's like a, I read philosophy at Oxford. It's almost like a category error we keep doing. We keep locating things in the individual and missing the system. Now, nevertheless, there are systematic differences between human beings, and Jaya's framework is one way to capture it. So I'll go to the character and spirit of the innovator. We also have uh, Jaya's uh, suggested uh, exemplars, and I realize David Bowie's there. Were you involved in that? <laughs> By the way, I can't stay for lunch. My colleague, Leonie, is, is here at the, the table. So any questions or conversations about Jaya, Leonie will be more than happy to pick them up. Um, our, our list has maybe more women than the Forbes list. Um, David Bowie, of course, no, that's a different conference that I'd love to speak at. Um, Grace Hopper, uh, no, sorry, where are we? Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage, uh, very connected. But the, um, the spirit of the innovator. You may recognize this in yourself as you sit here, this idea of a restless curiosity, um, a fascination, an openness to what's new, a kind of sense of searching, of just finding things interesting. Um, it happens to be that I do profile as an innovator, and people would say I'm distractible, right? Because there's always something new to read, always something new to learn. Um, across so many, I mean, human beings have done so much, you know? <laughs> uh, but, but that sort of curiosity, that sort of open-mindedness, for the innovator is also channeled into wanting to do something with it. So over the years, I've led the development of probably three or four different, um, I guess you would see as products. So we probably did the first ever uh, online 360 system in the UK, I realize now looking back. I just thought it was an obvious thing to do. Um, there's a boldness, let's do something, and a willingness to risk failure. And this theme about innovation and failure is one we're going to return to. So at the best, that's what the innovator brings. However, we need to take a look at this. I hate being a bit trapped behind here, but I'm guessing it's easier, easier for you to hear me. So here we have an organization. It's a technology business. They're involved in the world of um, microchip design. This is a bunch of their probably level down from VP, and they're the identified high potential people as they, could they move through to VP? Okay. Solo is the self-review to remind you, there's 52 people. Of those 52, 45 people at the point at which we crunched this data had asked for viewpoints feedback. On average, the viewpoints feedback number of respondents about six, six or seven. So there's quite a lot of data going into the right-hand chart, and you can see the distribution in terms of those nine leader types. This is a, an innovation tech business, and there's what, 14.5% self-profiling as innovators, but only 1% seen as innovators by their colleagues. Now, people aren't rating, do I see you as an innovator? They're rating the 34 strengths. So they don't know in advance. They're giving feedback about whether this person, they see this person as, as an innovator. This pattern we see time and time again. That the individual feels they have more innovation than their colleagues, completely broad spectrum of colleagues, recognize. So there's a mystery going on here. People feel they're innovative, but it's not seen. So we're going to a place of going, what is happening within organizations such that people's sense that they have a creativity in the spirit of innovation isn't being experienced by their colleagues. And we go deeper into our own data set, which is now, I think, about 15,000 self-reviews. And we find that people profiling as the innovator 
are much more likely to have low scores on certain of the key strengths. And the most important one of which I think is self-belief. So people profiling as strongly as innovators have lower self-belief. Now, I think that's really important. We have this wonderful Jeff Bezos quote, which I think is easy to say when you're one of the wealthiest people on the planet, but I think there's a real truth in it, which is failure and invention are inseparable twins. To invent, you have to experiment, and if you know in advance that it's going to work, it's not an experiment. Just about every large organization hates risk. One of the formative experiences for me in the 1990s was working with what is now Diageo, as they became Diageo, and they put together one of those, you know, the culture things, this, you know, where you put it, you print your values on a card and you put it in your top pocket, and that's going to galvanize everyone to behave in a particular way. And they had this massive, very beautifully produced document that was all about innovation and brand innovation and, and new product innovation. And as you went further through it, it got into stuff about financial discipline, and in there was this highlighted line, which is, we will have a culture of no surprises. Now, you don't need to be a genius to work out which of those people paid attention to, right? And that culture of no surprises is antithetical to a spirit of innovation. But if your innovators lack self-belief, which is often the case because they're the people who are trying and failing, trying and failing. And that failure can erode the soul, can erode that sense of it's worth going again. And so, and then there are these other strengths which are, are, are really important around connecting to the organization. Innovators are less likely to connect and they're less likely to have that sense of upbeat optimism about what they're doing. So there's a sort of way in which the innovator often is not influencing particularly well. When we go back to the leader types, we find there are many, many organizations who are strongly represented as executional types. An example I would give is Uber. We've supported and worked with Uber for a number of years. And we, in fact, our COO has joined us from Uber. Um, we were really struck by the number of people profiling as innovators and yet, on viewpoints, next to nobody was profiling. They were profiling as executional. And he was telling us that um, uh, Travis Kalanick had this thing about weekly sprints, you know, where you go again each week, weekly. And it was a, it, the, the, the phrase was kill or die each week. You either killed the initiative or you died trying to deliver it. Um, the rate of innovation in Uber, everyone could feel, was just collapsing as they became more and more executional. And the people who joined Uber because they felt it was an innovative new tech business felt that spirit of innovation was being squashed. So where am I going with this? I think it's pretty obvious. I'm going to say innovation is a manifestation of a high-performing team. It's high-performing teams that are the hero innovators. And high-performing teams need diversity of con contribution, and they need that diversity to be respected and valued. We turn the nine leader types into nine goals for teams. And again, if I had longer, I'd get you thinking about, if you were to choose one goal for your team, Actually, do that thought experiment. We won't have time to talk it through. If you, had, if you were to choose one goal for your team from these nine goals, you don't know much about what they mean. Get the white paper and we talk in depth about these nine goals. Choose one goal. Which is the one most likely to make your core work team more innovative? It might seem obvious, mightn't it, that you choose the innovative goal. But of course, human beings are complex creatures. And if your innovators are lacking in self-belief, 
you need to look elsewhere. If I go back to this, it may well be that focusing here on your team really working at getting the best out of each other is going to be the bit, the gateway that unlocks creativity in your team. It might be that focusing on the strategic goal is the most important one because people are fuzzy about where you're headed. And that simplified sense of this is where we're headed could be the thing that unlocks creativity. I won't go through all the goals, but you could probably do the thought experiment for yourselves around that. So just going for innovation isn't necessarily the thing that will unlock innovation within your team. When we look at the research evidence in the white paper, it's abundantly clear and well-researched and documented that creativity requires diversity, diversity of contribution. Um, and we need to think very richly and broadly about what create, uh, diversity means, I think, here. But more than diversity, you need inclusion. People have to feel that their value, their contribution is valued. We just ran a team session yesterday afternoon, so Jaya works in the flow of work, so we use it for ourselves. I run the product team, or I work with my colleagues in the product team. One of our colleagues is very practical in Jaya leader types, and she's saying, I just don't feel I make a, an innovative, creative contribution. And we were saying, you, you so misunderstand and underestimate the value you bring to us because of that practical grounding she brings, plus her ability to connect into the rest of Jaya as an organization. Teams need psychological safety if they're gonna create. Many sort of organizations, well certainly of our investors, get quite huffy about psychological safety. It's a woke thing, it's a snowflake thing. It's really clear if people don't feel safe to fail, they won't fail. If they don't fail, you won't have innovation. You want a low power differential. The more the team is characterized by distributed leadership, the more likely it is to be innovative. The higher the power dif differential, the less innovation. And you need generativity, just a flow of ideas. Five ideas are not good enough, 50. You stand a chance of coming up with something something good. So that's the creativity side, but for innovation you need more. You need judgment about which of these ideas are the ones to go for. You need bravery. Innovation requires bravery. And you need perseverance. I could, I'm aware of time, I need to keep my eye on time and keep, keep moving here. Um, and foundational to everything, they need the rich soil of trust. Trust within teams is fantastically important. It comes up time and again. Whatever dimension of team effectiveness you look at, trust mediates the variable. So, of course, if you look at the world of team development, and this is where Jaya comes in saying, it's stuck in the 1990s. Maybe as some aspects of publishing, academic publishing, possibly are in the 1990s, but I don't know your world that well. I do know first-hand experience of trying to access. <laughs> it was just a nightmare <laughs> as, as somebody who's, who's genuinely got an interest in disseminating research. I couldn't do it. It would have cost a fortune to us access the journals we wanted to. But um, trust comes up uh, time, and, time and again. The world of team development, we think, is stuck in the 1990s. People expect it to happen through an offsite that happens once a year. There's abundant evidence that just doesn't work. If you look at the highest performing sports teams, they're on the training pitch, they're practicing day in, day out. You look at work teams, they never practice. They just, quotes, perform. So JIRE exists to help people do development in the flow of work. And it's the flow of work, particularly when you're working remote and hybrid, that's the challenge. Right? Because you can't just go down to whatever, have a drink after work or have a coffee. It's much harder. So you have to work at creating trust. And the way you do that is by continual, repeated pieces of work. 
So finally, let me go to the practices that you can adopt now. And actually, I'd like you to think about which one of these six would you commit to? I'm not going to do the thing of going around saying, you know, commit to, make a public commitment. But which one of these six do you think will make the biggest difference to your team and your team's capacity to innovate tomorrow? First, human beings are problem solvers. Another Jeff Bezos quote, I think frugality drives innovation, just like other constraints do. I've often felt Jira is seriously underfunded, and yet I know that because we don't have fund, we don't have resource, we have to be creative. One of the only ways to get out of a tight box is to invent your way out. So you might feel that you don't have much resource. I could argue that you've got far too much. And when you've got far too much, you're at, you're at risk of an, an external innovator coming into your, to your world. It's what happens in the world of scale-ups all the time. Create first, evaluate second. People, when they're trying to come up with new ideas, censor them before they allow them outside their mouth. Create first, evaluate second. There is research that's saying the people who are best able to evaluate the value of a creative idea are the peer group. Managers are very poor at it, and quite often, you know, juniors or people reporting in are less, less good at it. But if you create that sense of a distributed leadership in your team, a flat team, and a team of peers, they will be the people best able to evaluate. So when you come up with great ideas, who's going to help evaluate them? Yeah, pressure. Does it help? Did 90 seconds help you be creative? If you'd had 180 seconds, would you be more creative? Amazon, of course, is famous for incredibly tight pressure. But so is Uber. Amazon has continued to be innovative. Uber ceased to be. It's getting better now, but ceased to be. Build the psychological safety so that people can be open about the emotional journey of innovation. It genuinely, you know, we can talk the words and say, yeah, failure is just part of innovation. It hurts. <laughs> you know, anybody, anybody who's truly involved in the world of creativity will tell you it just hurts. Having colleagues who can be with you at that moment matters. A rhythm of retrospectives, you're probably familiar with the world of agile, who've kind of embedded the idea of frequent retrospectives, maybe at least a month. Six simple questions. What went well? What contributed to that? What can we learn from that? What went less well? What contributed to that? What can we learn from that? Retrospective, once a month, team effectiveness will improve and your ability to innovate and create will. And finally, and particularly for anyone who's more senior here, Review your innovation killers. Now, it might be your compensation system, your bonus system. It might be your organizational structure. It might be the tools you use. It can be a whole range of organizational processes and system level things. As a team leader, you might feel you have very little control over this. You'd be surprised how much control you can exert. I'd, I'd I'd assert, but there's no doubt that even when people and teams get themselves into being innovative and creative, the system can kill that innovation, right? So those I'm going to offer to you as practices you can adopt tomorrow. Choose one, and I wish you very good luck in your journey. I don't know what happens now, but I'm done. <laughs> Okay. <laughs>